Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfect Snatus, where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our physiology playlist. In this video, we will review white blood cells, platelets, and hemoglobin. This is video number 62 in this playlist. Today, we'll review the topics quickly. For a more robust explanation, check out my hematology and bleeding and coagulation playlists, where we go over more detail. Let's answer the question of the previous video. We did a serum protein electrophoresis, and this is normal. What should we expect in a patient with type 4 renal tubular acidosis? This is actually a difficult question. So let's try this. Type 4 renal tubular acidosis is characterized by low renin and low aldosterone. If renin is low, what's going to happen? First, let's take a step back. What's the function of renin? It's to convert angiotensinogen to angiotensin 1. Okay, so if I have low renin, no one is going to convert angiotensinogen. So it's going to keep accumulating like this. So we'll have increased angiotensinogen. And as you know, angiotensinogen is a protein. Is it albumin or globulin? It is a globulin. Okay, is it alpha-1 globulin or alpha-2 globulin or beta globulin or gamma globulin? It's an alpha-2 globulin. So which of these graphs show an increase in alpha-2 globulin, the answer is D, right here. Look at this increased alpha-2 as compared to normal. Quick review on white blood cells or leukocytes. This is your neutrophil, this is your eosinophil, this is your basophil, monocyte, lymphocyte. All of your blood cells come from the bone marrow. Neutrophils, basophils, and eosinophils are collectively known as granulocytes because they have granules. Basophils have basophilic granules, which are blue. Eosinophils have eosinophilic granules, which are pink. Neutrophils have neutral granules. And that's why we gave them these names, by the way. Neutral, basophilic, eosinophilic. Collectively, these are the granulocytes because they have granules. How about monocytes and lymphocytes? They do not have granules. That's why we call them agranulocytes or non-granulocytes. All of your white blood cells came from myeloid lineage except lymphocytes, which came from lymphoid lineage. Unlike your red blood cells, your white blood cells actually have a nucleus. Again, granulocytes, non-granulocytes. What's the function? They defend your body against foreign invaders. Where do I find them? You find them in the Buffy coat. Granulocytes, non-granulocytes. How do we boost the formation of granulocytes? By giving granulocyte colony stimulating factor. How do we boost the production of monocytes by giving monocyte colony stimulating factor? How do we do both by giving granulocyte monocyte colony stimulating factor? All right, there is a disease known as agranulocytosis. What does granulocytes mean? Neutrophils, basophils, eosinophils. What does A mean? No. So it's a disease where we have absence or low number of granulocytes. So you have decreased eosinophils, neutrophils, and basophils, especially neutrophils. Why did you say especially neutrophils? Because neutrophils are the most abundant. They are about two-thirds of your total leukocytic count, which is your total white blood cell count. Normally, your white blood cells should be between 4,000 and 11,000. Of this number, 60% is neutrophils, and then lymphocytes are 30%, monocytes 3 to 7, eosinophils 1 to 3, basophils 0 to 1. These percentages are called relative count of the neutrophils. So the relative neutrophilic count normally is 60%. But what is the absolute neutrophilic count? Well, it's 60% of the 5,000 here. So 60% times 5,000 gives you a number. This number is the absolute neutrophilic count. The relative, absolute. And you do the same thing for everyone. Functions of white blood cells. Neutrophils are very important, especially against bacteria. These are the pus cells that can secrete pus. These are the cells of acute inflammation. These are the cells that make an abscess because an abscess is literally a collection of pus. Lymphocytes defend your body against viruses, fungi. Lymphocytes are responsible for chronic inflammation, not acute, chronic. Lymphocytes help make a granuloma. Lymphocytes are part of your immune system, especially the adaptive immunity, which is the acquired immunity, which is more sophisticated than your innate immunity. Lymphocytes are also involved in type 4 hypersensitivity reaction. How about monocytes? Monocytes basically are the macrophages. They are the same thing. But when they are in the blood, we call them monocytes. When they go to tissue, we call them macrophages. So a macrophage in the tissue, 
I'm a monocyte in the blood. The function is phagocytic. I eat bad invaders. I'm gonna eat your enemies. Also, the macrophage is an antigen-presenting cell. The macrophage can help make a granuloma. What's an antigen-presenting cell? We'll talk about this in immunity, which is coming in the next videos. Eosinophils defend your body against parasites. They are also involved in allergic reaction in anaphylaxis, which is type 1 hypersensitivity. Whenever I say eosinophils, remember, ew, parasites, ew, allergy, ew, anaphylaxis, ew. Basophils, histamine release. Histamine is involved in allergy and type 1 hypersensitivity. And also here we have two names. When they are in the blood, they're called basophils. When they go to tissue, we call them mast cells. Let's review some nomenclature. Basophils in the blood, masses in the tissue, they are the same thing. Monocytes in the blood, macrophages or histocytes when they are in the tissue. In the liver, they have another name, Kupfer cells. In the brain, they have a different name, microglial cells. We're done with white blood cells, let's review platelets. Again, for a more detailed discussion, check out my bleeding and coagulation playlist. Where did platelets come from? From megakaryocytes. Where did they come from? From myeloid stem cells. Where did they come from? From pluripotent stem cells in the bone marrow. Your white blood cells have a nucleus. Red blood cells do not have a nucleus. Platelets are not even cells. They are pieces. They are not cells. They are pieces. Pieces of what? Pieces of their grandmother, the megakaryocyte. This megakaryocyte literally exploded giving out thousands of tiny platelets. The platelets are not even cells, so please don't say that they have a nucleus, because they do not. Don't tell me that they have a mitochondria, because they do not. These platelets just have a cell membrane, which they got from the membrane of the megakaryocyte, and some cytoplasm, which they got from the cytoplasm of the megakaryocyte. And we have talked about all of this in my bleeding and coagulation playlist. What do I find in the cytoplasm of the platelet? Do I find organelles? Shut up, you find some granules. We have alpha granules and dense or delta granules. Pause and review. What's the function of the platelet? Let's talk about this. I injured myself. First, I should vasoconstrict to decrease blood loss. And then platelets will come to form a plug. We call this primary hemostasis. Then coagulation factors will come to form a clot. And this is called secondary hemostasis. After you have a clot, which is fibrin, and then it will trap your red blood cells, the clot is going to contract serum, and then let's destroy the clot and restore the normal function of the blood. After I injure myself, how do I make a clot and stop the bleeding? Here are your steps. Vasoconstrict, platelet plug, aka primary hemostasis, then coagulation or clot, secondary hemostasis, then fibrolysis, then regeneration, and everything goes back to normal. First step is vasoconstriction. When I injure myself, there's trauma, boom, the vessel is gonna constrict. It's a local myogenic response. It's an automatic reaction. After vasoconstriction, what do we have? Platelet plug. The platelet is like an engineer. It looks at the wall. If the wall is nice and smooth, this building is probably okay and was not damaged in an earthquake. But if the paint, but if the paint is removed and the area underneath the paint is exposed, well, this is probably a building that has been damaged in an earthquake. Platelets are moving and floating and singing in the bloodstream. If the endothelium is fine, everything is hunky-dory. But what if the endothelium is broken like this? And the area underneath the endothelium, subendothelial collagen, is exposed. The platelet will get mad. And when they get mad, they attach to the subendothelial collagen. How do they attach? GP1B from this side, von Willebrand factor from this side. After they adhere, they activate. They get mad, like real mad. And they start secreting ADP and thromboxane A2 which will help, well, gather more platelets. Hey, 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 friends, come here. I found an injured endothelium. They aggregate together. And when they aggregate, a molecule of fibrinogen happened to be there in between. And here we stop the primary hemostasis. The next step is to take that fibrinogen, convert it into fibrin, and this is the story of the secondary hemostasis or the coagulation cascade. Coagulation cascade should be started here. All right, what's the end result? I want some fibrin fibers, okay? How do you get your fibrin fibers? Well, I get it from fibrinogen. Fibrinogen is not active. 
How do I get fibrinogen which is not active into fibrin which is active? You'll need thrombin for this. Thrombin, the protein of thrombus. I love the name. And the fibrin is the protein made of fibers. Beautiful name. How do I get the thrombin? Well, it was inactive, known as prothrombin. How do I convert prothrombin, inactive, into thrombin, active? You need a committee of four members. And this committee is known as the prothrombinase complex, which will convert prothrombin into thrombin. What's that committee? We have two words and two numbers. The two numbers are 5 and 10. The two words are calcium and phospholipid. Who is the most important member of this committee? It's factor number 10. It was inactive. How do I activate it? Well, let me tell you two stories. There is the extrinsic story and the intrinsic story. Let's start with the extrinsic because it's shorter. All right. Give me an evidence that there has been an injury. The evidence is the presence of tissue factor in the blood. Tissue factor is called tissue factor because it should be in the tissue. But when it's in the blood, it only means one thing, that the tissue has been injured and now the blood and the tissue are one and the same and therefore you see tissue factor in the blood for the first time. This tissue factor is going to activate factor 7. When factor 7 is active, it's going to activate factor 10 and then this will activate prothrombin into thrombin, fibrogen into fibrin, boom, we have a clot. That was the short story. How about the intrinsic story, which is longer? All right, it has four members, 8, 9, 11, 12. Where is 10? 10 is here in the center. The center is called the common pathway. All right, 8, 9, 11, 12. Hey, 12, how do I get you to be active? I need an evidence of trauma. What's the evidence of trauma that you want? Subendothelial collagen. Why? Because when the subendothelial collagen is exposed, it means that the endothelium is injured and it means that trauma has occurred. All right, subendothelial collagen activates factor 12, which will activate factor 11, which will activate 9, which will activate 8. By the way, 8 needs a helper. The same stinking von Willebrand factor. 8 is active, 10 is active, prothrombinase complex is active, convert prothrombin into thrombin, fibrin into fibrin, boom, we have a clot. This fibrin is kind of loose. How do I make it more stable? Stable? Fibrin stabilizing factor, known as factor 13. Each one of these coagulation factors has a name and a number and most of the cases has a syndrome as well. We have talked about all of this in my bleeding and coagulation playlist. Do you remember the steps of hemostasis or stopping the bleeding? Yeah, number one, vasoconstriction. Number two, platelet plug. Number three, fibrin thrombus. Number four, fibrin lysis. Let's dissolve the clot. How do you dissolve the clot? First, what's the clot? Fibrin, which came from fibrinogen. Let's destroy both, okay? Destroy fibrin, it becomes fibrin degradation products. Destroy fibrinogen, it becomes fibrinogen degradation products. How do I destroy them? Plasmin is your hero. Plasmin, I love you. Where did you come from? I came from a precursor known as plasminogen. Well, who activated the plasminogen into plasmin? TPA, which stands for tissue plasminogen activator. Love the name. So here is your coagulation. In order to coagulate, you need to vasoconstrict and then primary hemostasis. This is the story of the platelet. And then secondary hemostasis. That's the story of the coagulation factors. Then fibrolysis. In the lab, how do I know that this is going fine? Plated counting time. How do I test for secondary hemostasis problems? PT and PTT. How do I test for fibrolysis? FDP, which is fibrin degradation products or fibrinogen degradation products and the D-dimer. Again, all of this was discussed before in my bleeding and coagulation playlist. We're done with the white blood cells. We're done with the platelets. Let's talk about red blood cells. Red blood cells are circular, biconcave, non-nucleated. Why biconcave? This biconcavity increases my surface area, which increases the surface area for gas exchange. Amazing. Flexible. I can squeeze through small capillaries. Also, it helped me, um, it makes harder for me to burst and explode. Why? Let's say that this red blood cell was put in a hypotonic solution. Therefore, the red blood cell is more hypertonic compared to the solution. Therefore, water is going to go from the hypotonic to the hypertonic. The red blood cell is going to swell a little, but it's not going to explode, of course, within limits. But imagine that we did not have this biking cave. Well... The first drop of water that enters will make me explode and boom, that will be the end of the red blood cell. Red blood cell, who made you? Bone marrow, who destroyed you? The spleen. And this happens after 120 days. That's my lifespan. 
After you destroy me, you will find hemoglobin, which becomes hemoglobin. Heme is iron and protoporphyrin. Protoporphyrin becomes biliverdin. Biliverdin becomes bilirubin. Before the liver is called unconjugated bilirubin. The unconjugated bilirubin is going to go to the liver, and the liver will conjugate it, and now you'll have conjugated bilirubin. That's it. The story of bilirubin was discussed in a video titled cholecystitis. You can find this on this channel. Red blood cells have a membrane and a cytoplasm, but they do not have a nucleus, no mitochondria, no ribosome. If you have no mitochondria, you will have no TCA cycle and no electron transport chain. My membrane is semi-permeable, elastic, flexible. The cytoplasm has hemoglobin, of course, potassium and carbonic anhydrase. Let's talk about hemoglobin, which is the most important piece of the red blood cell. IN means protein. Protein that's made of heme and globin. Love it. Hemoglobin is made of heme and globin. Heme is made of iron and protoporphyrin. What kind of iron is found on the hemoglobin? Is it Fe2 or Fe3? It's Fe2. The mnemonic is Fe2 binds O2. In the previous video, we have talked about the hemoglobin concentration. The normal hemoglobin structure, as you know, heme and globin. Here's your heme, here's your globin. Let me talk about the heme. The heme is made of protoporphyrin, this purple part, and iron in the ferrous state, which is the, the yellow spot here. Where's the globin? The globin are these four ribbons that you see here. We have two beta chains and two alpha chains. These big things that go like this. And inside each of them, there is a heme group. In an adult, you should have two alphas and two betas. We call this alpha 2, beta 2, or we call it hemoglobin A, A for adults. If you're a fetus, you should have hemoglobin F. Two alphas and two gammas. And F stands for fetus, not for F me. Where can I find oxygen in this beautiful structure? Oxygen will be found here, on the iron, on the heme. How many hemes do we have? We have four hemes in each hemoglobin. So, hemoglobin is like a car with four seats for four oxygen molecules. What's the name of the seat? The name of the seat is the iron, which belongs to the heme. Pause and review. Functions of hemoglobin, it transports gases. So it transports oxygen from the lungs to the tissue and carbon dioxide from the tissue to the lung. Hemoglobin is also a good buffer for the acid. Let's put hemoglobin in his place. Hemoglobin should stay inside the red blood cell, bound by the red blood cell membrane. But what if hemoglobin escaped out of the red blood cell? Well, it's going to end up in the bloodstream, and it's called hemoglobinemia. Eventually, it's going to reach the kidney. It's going to get filtered through the kidney glomerulus and will end up in the urine. We call this hemoglobinuria, hemoglobin in your urine. But wait, it gets worse. This hemoglobin can block the kidney tubules, causing acute renal failure. Too much hemoglobin in my blood is going to increase my blood viscosity and it's going to increase the osmotic pressure. All of this will increase the blood pressure and it's going to make it harder for your heart to pump because you're increasing the resistance against which the heart has to pump. What's the purpose of the placenta? Is to allow oxygen and nutrients to go from mommy to baby. Waste products and carbon dioxide will go in the opposite direction. Here's the placenta for you. Here's the mother's side. Here's the baby's side. These are the shifters of the oxygen hemoglobin dissociation curve. They were discussed before in a separate video titled oxygen dissociation curve. Don't forget that hemoglobin F will shift the curve to the left. And when you shift the curve to the left, oxygen is going to stay on the hemoglobin. Oxygen is not going to go to the cells. But when you shift to the right, you are giving oxygen from the hemoglobin to the tissue. But with left shift, the tissue is left behind. Hemoglobin F, which is the fetal hemoglobin, will give you a left shift, which means the tissue is left behind. Oxygen is going to stay on the hemoglobin. Whose hemoglobin? The baby's hemoglobin. What's the baby's favorite word? Mine. This is mine. So when there is a molecule of oxygen here in the placenta, in the interface between the mother and the baby, who's gonna take it? The baby. This is mine. How did the baby take it? Because the baby has hemoglobin F, which shifts the curve to the left, which means more affinity between the hemoglobin and oxygen. Oxygen is gonna stay on the baby's hemoglobin and away from the mother's tissue. Because the baby has hemoglobin F, but mommy does not. 
Normal hemoglobin has Fe2. Abnormal hemoglobin has Fe3. We call this methemoglobin. The word meta means change. Normal globin should be alpha 2 and beta 2. Two alpha chains and two beta chains. We call this hemoglobin A, A for adult. But abnormal hemoglobin or hemoglobin S is sickle cell disease, S for sickle. And the red blood cells are sickle like this. They can clog blood vessels, causing many problems. Another disease is known as alpha thalassemia, where you have defect in the alpha globin chains. There is a disease known as beta thalassemia, where there is a defect in the beta globin chains. Normally, in the arterial blood, hemoglobin binds oxygen. Makes perfect sense. In the venous blood, hemoglobin binds carbon dioxide. Yup, because the artery has oxygenated blood, the vein has deoxygenated blood. Easy. When the hemoglobin binds oxygen, this is known as oxyhemoglobin. When the hemoglobin binds carbon dioxide, this is called carbamino hemoglobin. Carbamino, not carboxy. Big difference. So, hemoglobin plus carbon dioxide is carbamino hemoglobin. Awesome. Where did the oxygen bind on the hemoglobin? On the iron of the heme. And the iron has to be in the ferrous state. This is oxygenation, not oxidation. Oxygen is just loosely bound to the hemoglobin. Oxygen does not furiously react with the hemoglobin. Oxygenation, not oxidation. Some lovely facts. Each hemoglobin molecule binds four molecules of oxygen. Do you remember the story of the car with four seats? That's true, because we have four heme parts in each one hemoglobin. Moreover, each gram of hemoglobin binds 1.33 milliliters of oxygen. Awesome. How about the carbon dioxide? Where is it getting attached? Does it attach to the heme? Shut up. It's attached to the globin. Which part of the globin? Since the globin is a protein, it's the polypeptide of the globin. Which part of that protein? The NH2 or the amino group or the amino terminus? Because as you know, amino acids or peptides have an amino terminus and a carboxy terminus. Here is a fun fact to keep in mind. Please remember this 1.33 or 1.34 because we will use it later to calculate the oxygen content. We'll see how many of you will remember this doozy fact. All of the uh, stuff that we have discussed so far was normal hemoglobin. But there is also abnormal hemoglobin that you see in diseases. If this hemoglobin bound to carbon monoxide, this is called carboxyhemoglobin. Carbon monoxide, carboxyhemoglobin. But the normal carbon dioxide is carbaminohemoglobin. Big difference. This is normal. This is abnormal. And carbon monoxide is evil because actually hemoglobin loves carbon monoxide more than oxygen. So carbon monoxide is going to bind to the hemoglobin and is going to kick the oxygen out of the hemoglobin. That's why you can die in a house fire. You're dying from carboxyhemoglobin. This is carbon monoxide poisoning. Another disease known as methemoglobinemia. Methemoglobin is an oxidized hemoglobin. Now, this is oxidation, not oxygenation. Oxygenation was normal. Oxidation is evil. Hemoglobin plus oxygen. Look at the, the nice, lovely, normal hemoglobin was Fe2+. Plus. But this methemoglobin, the ugly, evil, ferric, is hysteric. It's pathological. It has a darker colored. The patient will be described as having chocolate-colored blood and dusky-colored skin. I'm getting darker. Is it normal to have methemoglobin in the blood within limits? Like a very, very tiny amount is okay. But if you have a lot of it, you're sick. Why is a small amount okay? Because thankfully, you have NADP methemoglobin reductase enzyme in your blood. It's going to convert the methemoglobin, ferric, into normal hemoglobin, ferrous. Awesome. I have a video about carbon monoxide poisoning, another video about methemoglobinemia in my hematology playlist. If you like this video, you will love my antibiotics course. Learn about antibacterials, antifungals, antivirals, and antiparasitic medications in 40 beautimous videos. You can download it today at medicosisperfectsnanus.com. Also, there is my renal physiology course on the same website. And for a limited time, you can get a 40% discount towards anything on my website. Just use promo code KIDNEY at checkout.
In the next video, we'll talk about erythropoiesis, iron, vitamin B12, and folate. So please subscribe, hit the bell, and click on the join button. You can support me here or here. Go to my website to download my courses. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.